Sziasztok mindenkinek! Hello everyone, my name is Christine, and I am the host here at the Hungarian Heritage Podcast, the show where we connect your modern life to your Hungarian heritage. We will build bridges between Hungarians who live in Hungary to those with Hungarian heritage who live in all other parts of the world, not to mention the bridges that we will build between the generations. This podcast is a place where everyone is welcome, where you don't even need to be Hungarian or speak Hungarian to join in on the fun. We will talk about all the things that we love about Hungary, the Hungarian people, and the Hungarian culture, as well as the cool things Hungarian people are doing around the world. We will discover new things, review things you may already know, and we will have a lot of fun along the way. So if you're looking to make that first connection to your Hungarian heritage, or you're looking to dig a little deeper, then you're in the right place. Join me as we grow this community and continue to connect the circles of Hungarians around us. On this season two finale episode of the Hungarian Heritage Podcast, I once again have the pleasure of speaking with Ilka Coxis, the author of Ilka's Kitchen. Like bookends, Ilka was my first episode of season two. And now she is back on the podcast for my final episode of season two to talk about her experience as a winner and participant of the Balashi Summer University Scholarship Program in Budapest during the summer of 2023, which is organized by the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We are going to discuss all the details of Ilka's four-week cultural immersion experience, from the application process to the travel logistics to the housing and food accommodations. And of course, we will discuss the daily schedule of Hungarian language classes and cultural experiences included in this scholarship experience. Once you hear Ilka tell us about all of the amazing things that are included in this program, I am sure that you will want to apply for the scholarship for next summer. In this episode, Ilka and I also discussed the second edition of her cookbook memoir, Ilka's Kitchen, and all of the new things that were added to make this second edition cookbook memoir. And typically, we begin each episode with my guest's Hungarian heritage. But we've already discussed this topic with Ilka when she was my first guest of season two. So if you missed that episode, you should go back and listen after this episode so you can hear more details about Ilka's family's journey from Hungary to Australia. But don't worry, those details aren't immediately necessary for you to enjoy today's topic. So let's get started with our season two finale episode that is jam-packed with important details and insightful conversations with Ilka Coxis about the Balashi Summer University Program and her cookbook memoir, Ilka's Kitchen, Edition 2. Please join me in welcoming Ilka Coxis back to the podcast, and she's the author of Ilka's Kitchen, and she's not only here to talk about the second edition of her book, Ilka's Kitchen, she's back on the podcast for our finale episode to share with us her experience last year when she spent four weeks in Budapest with the Balashi Scholarship Program. Welcome, Ilka. Thank you so much for being back here and being the first and final episode of season two. Thank you so much, Christine, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be back with you. Absolutely. I feel like since uh, we met over Zoom the first time um, and then we luckily got to meet in Budapest last summer. I feel like we've become fast friends. So I'm excited to have you back and talk about your experience. So first, let's give a little bit of information to the listeners about the program that you applied for last year. And it's through the Balashi Summer Institute. Is that correct? Balashi Summer University. Um, And yes, I think the Balashi Institute is what they are called. Okay. And, you know, we discussed how to officially present this program because it is a program uh, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Hungary. And they provide, and I'm, I'm going to read right from their website because at least we're giving oh. the proper information. So right. it's the Balashi Scholarship Program. It's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade 
of Hungary. It provides learning opportunities for foreigners interested in the Hungarian language and culture, as well as Hungarian higher education. So you were a lucky participant of the Summer Institute program. Yes. Um, so that's why we're here. Uh, so let's first start out talking about how did you find out about this program, first of all? Yes. Um, interestingly, I just stumbled across it on the um, Embassy of Hungary Australia's Facebook page. Um, they had advertised it in, I think, April last year, um, uh, reaching out to Hungarian diaspora to apply for the scholarship. And I looked at it, went online and looked at the actual program and thought, oh, my goodness, I really, really want to do this. And um, so I went through the application process, um, which was quite rigorous, actually. I had to provide a, a CV, a curriculum vitae. Um, I had to have a reference from someone in the Hungarian community, um, and that happened to be the Hungarian embassy representative in Perth, in my hometown, and um, I know him very well, um, Fridzesh Schaefer, and he wrote an absolutely glowing reference for me. Um, and we had to sort of um, show how we are already currently involved in our local Hungarian community and how we could bring back the skills that we learn in Hungary uh, at the uh, Summer University Balashi Program back to our home countries and how we could enrich our, our own um, home Hungarian diaspora. Wow. So that's, uh, that's how I found out about it, yeah. Okay, so you found out about it in April, and this program takes place over the summer. So I believe it was in July. It was the in program's... July, mid-July. Right. So I didn't find out uh, that I was accepted until ooh, maybe six weeks before the beginning of the course. Wow. And I think that was the same for everyone um, across the world. And I was out at dinner with my family and an email came through. I, I knew the email would arrive at this particular time and I was hysterical, screaming with mm. excitement. I won the scholarship and um, then I proceeded to book my airfare and the scholarship is um, 100% covered as far as the accommodation and the, the learning materials go. So all I had to really consider was the, um, the flight there and back. Right. Wow. So at least you were out to dinner with your family. Uh, so you were yes. already in a celebratory mood when you found yes. out. So that was pretty yes. exciting, I imagine. So we had a glass of wine on top <laughs> of the one that we we're already having. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Exactly. That's exciting. So you found out that you were accepted, which is great. And like you said, pretty everything was covered except for the flights. So um, I'm sure you, you booked your flights immediately when you got home or the next day, because you're Definitely probably did, yeah. so exciting. So now let's, let's, I guess let's walk through the program. So let's start with logistics. Now you had your flight, like, how did that go? Like when you arranged your flight and you arrived in Budapest, how did you know where to go? Like what type of information did they give you like meeting points, hotels and things like that? Yes, yes, Christine. Um, well, I actually arrived a few days early um, and I had some friends from the UK that wanted to hold my hand and escort me <laughs> to, the, to the scholarship. Um, so I actually had a couple of days holiday with my lovely UK friends um, and we were told that we could um, enter the accommodation, oh, I think even on the Saturday before. So the scholarship started on the Monday morning. There was... Um, that was the the uh, meeting point, and some people arrived on Saturday. I decided to check in on Sunday afternoon, so that would I would be ready for the registration first thing Monday morning. Um, the hotel was easy to find. It was uh, we were given instructions how to get there. One thing I did ask though was because I'm a little bit older than probably a lot of the participants. Um, I wanted to know if my roommate would be close to my age or I requested someone that would be close to my age. So so we um we all had had to share a room. So I knew that in advance that we were right. sharing a, a hotel room with one other um, student. Um, and when I arrived on the Sunday she had already checked in and then we met that evening. 
And um, that's another whole story. That was uh, <laughs> such an incredible experience meeting this this amazing Argentinian lady. That's great. Well, I feel like it's nice that they give you a little bit of um, leeway, you know, with that request because, you know, we're kind of in the same age category. So it would have <laughs> been probably a little weird to be rooming with like a 19 year old. Although I know True. we both would have uh, made it work because, you know, we're both in education. So it would have worked, but the 19 year old probably would not have wanted to <laughs> room with us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, True. so the. <laughs> So that's great. So you arrived, you checked in. Now, so it's not just the accommodations, but it was also food was included as well. Am I right? That's right. So we had three meals a day um, at the Hotel Budapest. We also had a a conference room, which we all gathered in um, for the orientation. That conference room is often also used for lectures, um, uh, like small group um, lessons as well. And we also did things at our university site, um, which was on Pesh side of the river. Um, but, yeah, no, the three meals a day were breakfast, lunch and dinner, and sometimes uh, some of us didn't go back for lunch because our our, um, our lessons finished at 12.30 and then I would often like to have some Hungarian cobas, sausage and pickles and I would get things sort of out on the street and then go back to the hotel. But we would often have um a session in the afternoon after lunch so we most of the time we did have to come back and um go to the session uh but yeah every meal was provided um when we went on excursions we were given little light lunch packs to take with us so there was no need to purchase any food whatsoever if you didn't want to um occasionally a couple of girls and I would go out to a restaurant and have have lunch um together uh Fritzy Papa was one of our favorite restaurants (laughs) and um yeah so it was the food was great that's great that's great so they really do provide everything that's needed if you didn't want to spend more money on food or absolutely it's all taken care of except for the flight so that's good to know because um people were coming from around the world you know it wasn't people came from all over the world it was incredible there were um 60 scholarship winners I guess you could call us uh, or recipients and over 800 applicants worldwide applied for our particular scholarship last year Um, and people were from everywhere in the world interestingly I myself and a Canadian girl in my class we were um, probably the one of the few only English speaking students most people came from a country where they spoke a second language Oh, or that their original language plus English. Right. Uh, one of the criteria for doing the scholarship was you had to be able to speak English because the lessons were being taught right. through English. Yeah. Right. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I didn't realize that they had so many applicants, but only sixty people that they accepted. That's that's pretty great. Um, yeah. I wonder. I wonder yeah. how they narrow it down. I'd be I'd be interested to know more about that. talk a little bit about the program itself. So this program is really there to, you know, just immerse you a little bit more into your Hungarian heritage, culturally, language wise, because there were language lessons every day. So people are coming from around the world. You don't take a test before you go. So evidently there had to be like an initial language assessment. So tell us about that. And then after you tell us about the assessment, share with us how they did they break people up into language levels? So share with us that experience. Sure. At the orientation morning, we were all given a sheet of paper with, I'm pretty sure it was multiple choice questions um, in Hungarian, um, addressing all different areas of the language. I felt like I could barely complete any of it, which okay. was, I think, to be expected. <laughs> and then once we had all finished the test, we were individually called into a room to meet the scholarship staff, I guess. So the language department, the program manager, the language organiser, education coordinator, um, all those people were sort of sitting in front of us and we all went in individually to have a chat. 
And um, as people were coming out, people were saying, oh, they made me speak Hungarian or <laughs> uh, that was really nerve wracking. And my experience was quite amazing. I walked in and they all sort of leaned over the desk and said, tell us more about Ilka's Kitchen. Oh. So I believe I won the scholarship based on my book. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so that was, yeah, so they obviously look at everyone's background. Um, right. And then the test was just that was how we got placed into our level of learning. And I was placed exactly correctly. Um, they did say that there might be some shuffling around if people – once they got into their group, um, they found the language to the lessons too easy or too hard. There was right. a little bit of movement, but for me, I was in the right level right from the beginning, which was really encouraging and reassuring. And the textbook I was given was a, a compact version of the one that I had been using at home in Perth. Um, and yeah, so I felt very comfortable straight away that I was in the in the right class. But it was basically just a, a quick written test and a brief um, interview with the panel, um, and then we were all on our way. Wow, that's pretty exciting. So now you had language classes every day. Tell us a little bit about that. How long was it? You know, what were the types of things? Obviously, you were going through the textbook, but tell me about the experiences. Oh, the experiences were incredible. Um, there's nothing nothing better than face-to-face -face learning. Um it was interesting how they set it up. We had a one teacher for two weeks and a different teacher for the next two weeks, and the lessons ran from 9 to 12.30 every day with a 15 to 30-minute um, break in between depending on how um, excited we were to keep going. Sometimes mm -hmm. we would just have a short break and then get straight back into the lesson. Um, my first teacher was a really young guy, Martom, and he was so bright he was just very um just his learning style was really interactive he made us get up and write things on the whiteboard um he would use his phone and uh we would um, do little quick quizzes on our phones um to do with the language um so his technique I really um felt I learned a lot from him yeah so he was really good and then this the last two weeks was an older lady um she wasn't old but she was a mature lady, and she had been in the performing arts, I think, in the past. So her focus was very much about the pronunciation of the Hungarian language. Okay. And she did a lot of lessons through song. Um, we learned so many nursery rhymes. <laughs> um, I even recite one in my Ilka's Kitchen second edition, the chapter on the Balashi Scholarship. Um, there's a a small one of the small repetitive rhymes that she was teaching us um I wrote that in the book just to illustrate to people that's that's how she was teaching us right. she also uh, got us to listen to a very famous singer um uh I can't remember her name but she was yeah a very famous Hungarian singer of several years ago and we listened to her sing um, but she also taught us so we were still learning the language but uh, her focus was definitely on us making sure that we could pronounce Hungarian words correctly. So I felt like I got the best of two different styles of learning. At first I thought, why are we having two different teachers? And I'm not actually sure why they do that, right. but most of us did have um, a change of teachers two weeks through. Um, but I felt it was um, it worked really well That's for fun. our class. It's yeah. interesting that they thought to focus on those two different like learning styles, you know, where it was interactive with, um, the first gentleman, and then more so with the pronunciation, with, you know, the mature uh, teacher, I hate to say yeah. an older, because, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, a little older we're than most of the students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, forever young, though, just right. Um, so yeah. how long were the classes each day? Uh, the language part of the classes, how many hours approximately did you spend? It was a good three, three and a half hours, and it was okay. very intense. I was always exhausted afterwards, like right. mentally exhausted and uh, very hungry because I think when you're using your brain so much, it's like yeah. doing physical exercise. Right. Um, and in the breaks, I would eat a churro rudi, you know, those yep. little chocolate Hungarian traditional chocolate. So that got me through the breaks. So I would eat one of those. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so the intensive learning was every uh, Monday to Friday, every morning, up until lunchtime, then lunch break, and then in the afternoons we had um, various programs. Um, for example, the first week, oh, the first day after the 
uh, oh, that was the open ceremony. Then we did a city walk in the afternoon. The first classes actually started on a Tuesday. And then in the afternoon, we did team building language class at the hotel. Uh, yeah, so every day there was only occasionally there would be an afternoon free during the week. Um, but other than that, we were doing, oh, I did a course on Hungarian literature, which was my, I was in my absolute element there um, with an English mm-hmm. teaching background. I just loved learning about Hungarian literature. So, and that was an optional activity, actually. So there were a few optional oh. um, afternoon activities. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So just very quickly before we talk about the afternoon activities, did you have homework with the language classes that you had to do? Yes. <laughs> oh, no. Tell <laughs> us about the homework. That. Yes. <laughs> tell, tell me about the homework. Oh, uh, it was okay. It was sort of going over what we'd learned that day or or practicing um, or actually working in our in our Majorok um workbook right so it would be given like a page or two to complete in that okay. and then the next day in class obviously we had to make sure we had done our homework or we would sure. be naughty children and get into trouble <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's that's funny so okay so the afternoon cultural classes you know I remember uh seeing pictures from your social media that you had yep. like an embroidery class. I think you did a little embroidery, didn't you? Yes, there? yes. Yeah. So we Talk did. Um, wasn't embroidery. It was. It was uh, making um, little bracelets. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember what they're actually called. They're like little hand embroidered things that um, often weaving, sort of old oh, fashioned okay. weaving skills of right. um, olden days gone. So that <laughs> was. I'm. I'm not very good at craft um so I did struggle a bit making my little bracelet but I did we got lots of help so it was good that was a fun activity did you learn any folk dancing in the the program tell us about that yes so we had a a scheduled um folk dance evening which um was one of the highlights for me because two or three years about four or five years ago I actually did join my local Hungarian folk dance group um, and gave it a bit of a go. Um, it's not the easiest style of dancing, but I did bring with me my folk dance shoes and my skirt. So I went in there looking like a you know experienced Hungarian folk dancer, but um, I clearly wasn't. <laughs> but everyone participated. It was a whole evening of dance. We had a live Hungarian gypsy band oh. playing with us, uh, two professional Hungarian folk dancers, and uh, we did individual dancing and group dancing um and that was everyone really got into it I was I was wasn't sure if everyone would because it's not everyone's thing to to do right. dance let alone Hungarian folk dancing but with the live music um made it much easier as well we we really enjoyed that so that was definitely a highlight for me that's great so you really had like the gamut of like activities between language it's studying yeah. but you also had like the crafty things and the dance yeah now you said that there were also some excursions outside of uh the there classroom. was tell us about some yeah of those. they were they were incredible too um one of the first ones was um the hospital in the rock museum okay um I found that very uh, challenging, though, because it was um, I had heard about that that museum in the past, but had never been there, and it was a very intense emotional experience for me because it did show uh, pictures on the wall of people from the Hungarian Revolution, mm-hmm. and um, I felt like I saw my parents on the wall, so that was a bit confronting. But it was it was a very good learning experience, um, and a, the tour guide was amazing. Um, so that was a bit of a sad one. But um, the other ones we went on were, we did go to Balaton, Lake Balaton. Um, that was more of a, I felt like that was more for the young ones to sort of experience the lake and go for a swim and it was a really hot day. Um, but two or three of us um, older ladies, I really, really wanted to go to, to uh, Vesprem, which okay. is very close to to Balaton. Um, and that's where my... Um, paternal ancestors are from all of them are from that area and I had never been to Vesprem so a few of us so we were allowed to do that we didn't we could go off and do other things but most of the people that on that Bolaton excursion stayed at, at the at the lake but I was really grateful that these two friends of mine wanted to 
um, spent a couple of hours in Vesprem and we just looked at the old um, Kingdom of Hungary, the, the first King of Hungary monument was there. And um, so that was a really interesting excursion. We did go to Centendre, which I have been to many times. I have a cousin that lives there, but we actually went to the, oh, how do you say it, the Skansen, the, it's an open air museum. Okay. Just out of Centendre. And it actually is a life-size outdoor museum of all the village, what the villages used to look like in olden day Hungary. Um, so that was pretty much a whole day excursion. Had lunch in Centendre, which was delicious. Uh, and then uh, we went off and looked at the um, this outdoor museum, which was, that was definitely another amazing highlight. Um, and what else was there? There was a few other. There was a uh, city park boat ride. Um, I didn't actually do that one. I was sick that day. Yes, that was mostly it. So when you went out to Santendre, did you take the train? Oh, yeah, no, we were taken in a bus. Oh, okay. So, That's cool. Yeah, Santendre. Oh, and some people at the end of the day um, ended up catching a ferry back back to oh, the city or a boat nice, back, nice. back to the city. But That's um great. I jumped on the bus to, to come back. Right, right, right. Yeah, That's so excellent. we got very down in a bus. That's nice. It's great that mm-hmm. they not only, you know, keep you in the classroom with intense classes, but it's nice that they're taking you out and, you know, showing you cultural things and places. And so it, it's really a full experience, which is which Oh, is it's a full, full cultural language experience for anyone that wants to um, learn mm-hmm. about, more about their Hungarian heritage. It's such an amazing opportunity four weeks is actually a decent amount of time to really right. learn a lot about your cultural heritage for yeah sure. four weeks is a long time I mean it's, it's a it's a really nice amount of time you know to mm, really you feel is. like you're you're absorbing yourself into yeah. into the culture so did yeah. you have downtime in this program yeah um not a lot actually okay. which was fine um I think I mentioned a couple of afternoons we didn't have things on but that was right. very few and far apart um some days were one two three yeah most all, all Sundays were free for us to do as we pleased I caught up with my cousins my roommate went down to Serbia I think just did a long day trip to catch up with some relatives that she had never met before nice so on the Sunday everyone pretty much did their own thing we would do our washing um that was sort of the day that the the hotel had washing machine facilities thank goodness right. um so we could all go down and, and do that so that was really the only downtime we had mostly only Sundays and a few spots during the week on an afternoon well I guess that's good because in the you, evenings as well of course you want to keep students busy too much downtime <laughs> leads to pranks and silly things right <laughs> that's right <laughs> <laughs> someone decides to apply for the program next year and it's four weeks it's everything's included but do you have any advice for anybody that is going to be a participant for next year what are any additional things that you would suggest to bring or to purchase while you're there that you would that you found helpful yeah um you don't need to bring a laptop for example um If you have a a smartphone, that's sufficient. If you have any lessons that, that, you know, my first teacher wanted us to do a few things on our phones, um, don't really need a laptop. Um, It was very hot. I didn't expect Budapest to be that hot in summer. I haven't been there in summer since I was a little girl. So bring lots of summer clothes. That's really it. Um, Everything was just so easy. As I said, the food was provided. That's Not great. Really. I think I've, we've covered a lot by the questions right. you've been asking me already. I did actually have a lady contact me a couple of weeks ago, um, my Hungarian language teacher here at home. She won the scholarship and so she actually um, emailed me and asked me a bunch of questions, but they're pretty much what I've just told you. Right. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So did the program give you like a list of things, like, you know, make sure you bring, you know, a, a converter for your plug-in things I'm sure they provided um I think they did like a little um, list probably in the original correspondence but I probably was too excited to read it probably 
<laughs> well, the good thing, but, you know, they were very thorough in in yeah. everything. I think I even uh, emailed them and said, "Oh, you could you could actually email the um, oh, she's a lovely the education coordinator from the language department." Um, she was sort of my go-to if I needed to ask anything. That, oh, that's that, good. And she would forward me on to someone if I needed um, further assistance. They also had a medical person on staff if you needed, if you were sick, um, you could see that person at the hotel. Oh, there were also a team of, oh, they were called hosts. So we had hosts and they were one, two, three, four, five of them. Um, they were the the youngins that would take us out on our excursions. Oh, great! So they they were great fun. They were really gorgeous people. Um, yeah, it was a group <laughs> of two Aww. two girls and three three guys. And um, yeah, they would be the ones that would um, get us to the bus stop. And one coordinator, and in fact, she was so so cute. Um, she would say "bolashi bolashi," like she would call out. That's who we were. <laughs> Students come here, but she would just say bolashi, bolashi, and we were all kind That's of so run to the bus stop because we often we'd be like chitty chatting, and right. so it was we were like school kids pretty much. Cool. So. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. That's cute. So now, did they provide a transportation pass for you, or is that something you had to purchase when you arrived? Uh no, they gave us a. We had a lanyard with our wow. personal ID on it, and I still have my. Uh, transport pass on the back oh. of my phone. I can't part with it. It's hundred percent expired now, but it was <laughs> for more than a month, and we had to make sure we had that with us every time we caught public transport. Wow. Um, so yeah, it was a ticket for uh, all transport within the city. In fact, I think it went as far as St Andre as well. So just wow. out of the city. So it was not. Yeah. So we got presented with that. That are in our packs the day we arrived. That's amazing. And in our so lanyards as well. It really is a full service program. Which, it is. Yeah, it was I mean, outstanding. That's... I was so impressed. So impressed with the organization, the quality of the teaching, um, the excursion content. Everything was outstanding. Like there's nothing I can fault with the program oh, at all. That's amazing. So this next question is um, an interesting question. So if you were a representative of the Balashi program, who's also gone through the program, give us your best elevator pitch why people should apply for this summer program experience. You should apply for the Balashi Summer School program to become more immersed in your Hungarian heritage, more connected with the Hungarian diaspora. It is no better way to immerse yourself in becoming more Hungarian. I felt like such a Hungarian girl by the end of the scholarship. It's not funny. Even those who may not be Hungarian that do the scholarship, you will feel such a connection to that amazing country and culture. Wow, that's perfect. <laughs> they should hire you for their advertisement. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a year now since you've been there uh, and that you've experienced all these amazing things that you've told us about. How has that changed your life? Like, how is life different for you now regarding like your Hungarian, like your Hungarianness um, and yeah, your Hungarian yeah. I, connection to your community? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think my community, um, Hungarian, the Hungarians in my community identify me more as a Hungarian now. Um, I hope to become involved more in the Hungarian committee in my hometown of Perth at some point. Um, one of the, the ladies that I often do cooking with, she said to me when I came back, well, I'm only going to speak to you in Hungarian now when we're mm -hmm. cooking for the Hungarian community. That sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't because we're so busy trying to serve our community. <laughs> right. um, I, as I said, I feel more Hungarian than ever, uh, especially being there, living like a Hungarian, like a Magyar Lan, like actually living there as a Hungarian girl, which I've never had the opportunity to do ever in my life, being born in Australia to Hungarian parents. Going for holidays, short holidays, is not the same as what I just did last year. So it was a gift I will never, ever um, take for granted or ever forget. That's beautiful. I think that was really well said. I think the program definitely gave you not that it should need to give you more clout, but I feel like it gave you more clout within the community um, because they respect. I think that's that, what they want. Yeah, the, the program. That's that's sure. what, sorry. 
that's uh, I think that is part of their objective to to get people more involved in the diaspora yeah. around the world. Yeah. Well, it definitely worked in your case. So I don't necessarily know if this was one of the questions we talked about, but tell me about some of the friendships you've made there. Do you still stay connected with these people? Yes. Where do I start? So my roommate, <laughs> um, Vero, she is Argentinian and we connected the moment we met. We just have, in fact, I think we communicated with each other this morning. So we often talk um, through WhatsApp and we have such a close bond. It's not funny. We're very different people um, with very different backgrounds, but there was just this connection that that we established through our um, common love of our Hungarian heritage. Um, she was so much fun. We we did lots of things outside of um, the program together. We would. Uh, there was one day that we actually walked past the the statue of the soldier of from the Hungarian Revolution and I actually got really upset because I had never actually seen the statue before and we were actually on a, on a um, that was actually on a group tour, we were walking past it and then I said to her, I really need to go back to that statue and look at it properly and, and think about it and she said, let's go, I'll take you. So with the next day we did, did that together. So we did lots and lots of things together. Um, there was another girl from Brazil who was in, in the room next door to us. So the three of us were the three Amigas. <laughs> so they were the Latin Americans and I was the Aussie Aussie girl. Nice. Um, so we kind of stuck to, together a lot. Um, at breakfast time, we kind of, everyone sat with different people um, or, and some sat in their own little groups, but most of the time we kind of all sort of um, blended in with each other. So breakfast, lunches and dinners, we, we would all eat in a communal area. My classmates in my language class, I had um, a Canadian girl who um, I'm friends with her as well. She's lovely. There was a, another Brazilian girl, a girl from Korea, oh, Mongolia, really wow. interesting lady from Mongolia. She was beautiful, really, really spiritual lady. Um, a boy from Turkey and um, actually I met another lady from Turkey. She wanted to buy my book. I had a few copies of my book and um, I don't know how, she ended up with a copy, but she came downstairs one morning crying, saying how much she loved my book and that she wanted to write something similar. Um, so she and I have connected quite a lot. And um, as it turns out, I'm going to Hungary in September, as you know, for my daughter's wedding. And we've decided to actually go to Istanbul as part of our, after the wedding, our, the rest of our, um, to get over the wedding, we're going to a couple of places before coming back to Australia. <laughs> And we've decided to go to Istanbul and I've contacted um, Tunde, my uh, Turkish friend, and uh, we're going to catch up. So she'll be the first person from the scholarship program that I will see again in, within a year of the program. So, um, yes, made so many friends, a um, couple of really close ones. And, yes, that's that's a huge part of the scholarship actually, making friends from with people from different parts of the world, yeah. especially coming from Australia where we're still quite isolated um, I mean, we are a very multicultural country, but to meet people that are actually living in these other countries um, right. and learning about their cultural heritage as well was fantastic. Wow. That sounds amazing that you got that experience and you have stayed connected with these people. And, and I guess that's also part of, you know, the goal of the program is that you're not only connecting to your heritage, but learning about other people and connecting with them. Isn't it amazing that when you just put yourself out there a little bit, like what comes back to you, just taking that little bit of a risk to do that experience or write your book or, you know, start this podcast. It's the amount of friends and connections that we've both made. We've you know, both are making is incredible. Yeah, including each other. I feel like so blessed that I just took the risk because it's and, worth it. Yeah. It's really worth it. This process and doing these interviews yeah. with you is just just so exciting, and yeah, it's just an absolute gift to our heritage that we are able to use it in a way that we're connecting with each other, Absolutely. and um, yeah, the rest of the Hungarian diaspora. Yeah, and more to come. We always have more to come. So, actually, before we switch gears, let's mention that the Balashi program. There are other programs. If you're looking to attend university. In Hungary, you know, there's preparatory programs, there's year-long programs, there's, I believe, programs that are, you know, maybe 10 weeks or one semester. So if people are interested 
in things other than the summer program, the four week cultural and language immersion, they should definitely check out the website. I will definitely put that in the show notes. Apply for it, people. It's yeah. 100% worth it, whichever Absolutely. one you choose to do. Um, and it's a huge honor to be to have been accepted. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I got to experience it. Yeah, that's so lucky. Honestly, like I, I really wish that I could have done it. I couldn't apply last year because I had some other travel plans happening and I couldn't yeah. be gone that long. So next um, time, next, next one. time, for sure, for Definitely sure. Give it a go. <laughs> or we could do uh, one of the other ones together, maybe. That's true. I am I am yes. definitely interested in some of the other things that they have on their website. I do want to end with their mission, or at least parts of it, just so that people mm-hmm. can have a little bit of like a closure to this. And it yeah. says through the Balashi Scholarship Program, and I'm, I'm reading from their website, the Hungarian government contributes to the development of economic, political, and cultural relations between the participant countries and people with Hungary and to increase the number of professionals and I guess students taking part in this process and they can use their Hungarian language skills and knowledge after, you know, the different types of training, whether it's the summer program. And one of the last lines that's in there, it says the people of the Hungarian diaspora can also increase their knowledge of the Hungarian language and culture. And I think it's definitely a worthwhile thing to look into if it's something that you haven't experienced yet or you're looking to just deepen your Hungarian heritage connection, language, and culture. So I'm so happy that we were able to talk about that and that you were able to share your great experience. Now we're going to switch gears officially because we're also here to talk about the second edition of Ilka's Kitchen, which was just recently released. For those who are just joining us in the podcast, and maybe you haven't listened to um, episode one of season two, when I had Ilka on the podcast, she was telling us about her book, Ilka's Kitchen. And I think, can you give the listeners who are just joining us, because maybe they haven't started at the beginning of all of my episodes, give them like a few sentences about what Ilka's Kitchen is about, because it's not just a cookbook, it's a little bit more. True, exactly. Yeah, so Ilka's Kitchen and the sub subtitle is um, Stories and Recipes from My Hungarian Heritage, which is exactly what it is. So I actually start off with um, a brief history of my Hungarian heritage sort of my parents' journey of um, escape from escaping from um, Hungary during the 1956 revolution, my childhood, um, how they lost their connection to their Hungarian heritage, but I discovered it. Well, I always had it in me. Um, and then as I became an adult, I started cooking Hungarian food. And as the years have gone on, I've just become more and more involved and connected to my my Hungarian ancestry or identity. I feel very, very much a, a Hungarian girl. I, I'm very proud of my Australian um, heritage as well or my, or my Australian home, um, but my Hungarian heritage is such a powerful part of who I am these days. Um, yeah, and then within the book too, I talk about some travel stories in Hungary, uh, family travels, um and places I've been to, that sort of thing, and and how food has how Hungarian food has impacted me in those travels. Um, and then at the end, I even had like a little creative writing piece about um, one of the times I was there on my own in Budapest. Well, I was actually with my mum, but it was like my last day there, and I wrote a creative piece about how I felt about my last day in the city of Budapest. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a mainly a cookbook, but it has a, quite a big section on um, family history, memoir, a um, bit of creative writing, and now a whole chapter on the Balashi Summer University. So it's quite a, um, there's a lot there. And there's a lot of photographs yeah. in there too of cooking um, and yeah. some family photos. So it's, yeah, there's a lot yeah. there. There is a lot there. So for those of you who didn't hear, you should definitely go back and listen to episode one uh, of season two because because that's where we really dive into um, your first edition of Ilka's Kitchen. And, um, you know, now in the second edition, you've added more things. And I just I really love the format. uh, And I've always loved the format. And we talked about that 
in your first episode as well that it's it's more than just a cookbook it's a memoir you're you know you're connecting to all of these um experiences because even though they are your individual experiences you know people have parallel situations where oh, they absolutely. feel that connection so it's more than Very just like so. looking in your um cookbook for how to make something you know you're going to find a story and you're going to find pictures so tell us a little bit about the second edition okay well i've just felt such a strong desire to add a chapter about the balashi scholarship um that was probably my main goal just to to put a whole chapter in there about the program so there's pretty much what i've just talked about examples of the things that i did photographs, um, just a really good outline of someone who's done the program and I just thought my book was a a great vessel to show more about the Hungarian diaspora. Um, And then the other extra things I put in was a beautiful foreword by my uh, the Honorary Consul of Hungary from Perth, Western Australia. So he wrote a beautiful foreword for the book. Um, in the first edition, I kind of wrote the foreword. So my foreword is now the preface. And then there's about five or six more recipes in the book. One of them is actually from a cookbook that my mother gave me, a 1956 edition cookbook that was sent to my mother by her grandfather. And I just felt like I wanted to put something in there from that era and it's the chestnut puree recipe. So mm-hmm. it's just like a little bit of a story about, because um, I don't actually make that. It's I just wanted to put something in there that represented sort of my my journey as well. Right. Um, another recipe, cremesh, is a delicious custard kind of slicey thing. Um, so delicious. Oh, so delicious. And, again, uh, someone from the Hungarian community makes that, and I said to her, oh, my God, I would love to put that in my book. Uh, I want to make my own version of it. So uh, over the last six months, oh no, last year or so, I've been testing my own version of it. Uh, and then I asked her if it's okay if I put that in my book and would she like some acknowledgement? She said, absolutely not. The only thing I added from her was that she said, you add butter into the custard custard mixture. And she just said, you just have to keep adding until you know it's enough. Like it was just no quantity. It was just that typical cook, yeah. um, you know, sharing of a recipe. But at the end of the day, you just have to make it your own. So uh, yeah. I added that little comment that she made into that recipe. And my recipe, again, is quite different to hers as, it, you know, I've just turned it into something a little bit, just my version, which I think all recipes are. Everyone ends up making yeah. their, you have a template, which is obviously all the recipes I've written in my book are uh, uh, examples of how I cook and if you choose to cook exactly as what's on the page go for it uh, if you don't which most people don't you end up improvising somewhat and yeah. at, at each time you make something uh, often my paprikash chica is different sometimes I'll make it with a lot of sour cream sometimes I won't add as much and in fact, in fact I think the photos in my book there's one that looks quite creamy and then there's one that looks more paprika styled yeah so there was a and there was another couple of main dishes but on the whole I decided to call it a second edition rather than a revised edition because I have that um, creative freedom to do so I think and at the same time I felt there was enough content in there to call it a second edition so it's still the same book but it's got a whole extra chapter a foreword and half a dozen recipes or so so it's still great if you've got the first book um, and the second one's just got that that little bit more but I think that's it for the book I don't think I'll be adding any more to it otherwise it'll end up being an encyclopedia so (laughs) exactly (laughs) we are going to give away a cookbook for the second edition so be on the lookout for that through social media now tell us how people can purchase the book directly from you okay um, being a self-published author, and it's quite a large book, the only way I am able to sell it at this point in time is through my social media. Um, I have been very, very successful in that regard. I have a Facebook page. Um, if you just type in Ilka's Kitchen, I will pop up straight away. People can message me directly. The price of the book is in Australian dollars, uh, but if you're in the US, you can order it through PayPal. 
and uh, pay to select Australian dollars and that way you'll get the book um, a bit cheaper for you guys because our dollar is horrible, the Australian yeah. dollar. <laughs> I also have an Instagram account um, called Ilka's Kitchen as well um, and you can message me on that platform as well and um, I assume also through you, Christine, on your website. Of and- course, absolutely. And obviously I will leave all that information in the show notes. So um, if somebody was you know, listening and you didn't hear exactly what the website was or the PayPal, I'll leave all that information um, so that you could contact Ilka or myself and we could get you your book <laughs> sent yeah, out to it's you. Very, very easy. Um, yeah, I've had so, sure. so many people buy, purchase my book in the USA and Canada, and it's it's um, a very simple process. Um, my Australian listeners, um, again, they can just message me, and I post them post to them directly through a direct debit through just our normal banking system in Australia is the right. the easiest way to to buy the book. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I'll definitely leave that information in the show notes. So thank you. Tell me what is on the horizon for you as an author? I know you have some things cooking on the stove back there. So can you share anything with us without divulging too much information? Uh, It's very, very early stages. Um, I did a novel writing course last year and wrote a very brief synopsis of a novel, um, which I now want to turn it into something a bit more historically based so I want to write a historical fiction novel based on loosely based on family who went through things like my grandfather I recently found out was it held in a um, Siberian gulag and was released I think after the fall of Stalin I think he well I didn't think he did get released back home and um, he didn't survive very long after that but I would love to write a fictional story based on sort of the Hungarian Revolution, my family history, and I have a kind of a title in mind that I'm thinking of calling it. I mean, don't definitely don't spill the beans. I mean, you did tell tell me and I, it's amazing. So if you're listening, it's amazing. And I can, I can attest to that. (laughs) So yeah, I'm hoping to do that. I've always wanted to write a novel. So um, that once I get over my daughter's wedding, um, (laughs) I will hopefully have some free time and really start doing some, I I clearly will have to do some research. I've already actually reached out to my, um, I had a genealogist that did my family tree a couple of years ago because I have very, very little information about my Hungarian family, even though everyone is from Hungary, like my entire family are from there. Um, I don't have a lot to go on and what I do have, I will use to the best of my ability. And, um, but the genealogist, um, I'm hoping he's going to get back to me to give me some information about my grandfather's um, time in the Russian gulag. So that wow. that would be a great way to start, I think. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So lots of things on the horizon for you, which I'm very excited about because I know that we'll be back recording another episode so that you can tell us all about it. I wish you so much luck. Uh, I know your daughter's getting married in September in Budapest. So congratulations yes. on that. Thanks. Hopefully she'll let you post some social media pictures so we can I enjoy a little. So. Yeah, maybe just, you know, one, maybe one, you know, even if it's just yeah, like her yeah. beautiful dress. Yeah, she's a very private person, yeah, unlike her mother, but, um, <laughs> but she's, um, I'm very honoured that she has decided to choose Budapest for her wedding. Um, and I think it is, I think she's catching the bug off me honouring her Hungarian roots. And That's um, beautiful. Yeah, it's it's going to be amazing. I've actually written a poem that I'm going to recite at the um at the wedding. Oh, I hope she doesn't listen to the podcast until after the wedding because <laughs> she doesn't know I'm yeah. doing that. Yeah, don't don't worry, don't tell her. That's okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. I really appreciate your friendship and the connection that we've made. You know, just through the podcast and meeting in Budapest and just even like the chit chats that we have over, you know, WhatsApp and sometimes we Zoom. Yeah. So thank you so much. It really means a lot that, you know, we we have this friendship. Thanks for telling us all about your experience at the Balashi summer program where you earn the scholarship. Definitely people should check that out. Again, that'll be in, the, in the show notes. 
thanks so much for being here again. Thank you for being the finale episode. Thank you so much for having me, Christine. It's it's been an absolute honor to be working with you, and on top of that, to become friends and to have a, a, actually have met you in person as well. Again, I think the connection we made was instant with each other. Okay. Um, you're doing an amazing job. Um, you know, we're talking about me today, but honestly, the work that you're doing for the Hungarian diaspora through your podcasts finding all these people that have Hungarian roots or or are doing things for the Hungarian diaspora is incredible. So I'm in awe of you and I really do thank you for considering me as part of your journey. Oh, thank you. That really means a lot. And that was so nicely like worded. I feel so I'm blushing. I know you can't see oh, that. I'm, I'm about to cry, I think. <laughs> thank you so much. Cause I, I really do feel like you know, not every journey is easy. And this has been a fun, stressful, um, yeah, exciting, it's... educational journey. Um, and absolutely. So, Both of us for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. A thousand thank yous for being on the podcast today. I look forward to talking to you more pleasure. and uh, we'll speak soon and stay tuned for all the information we talked about in the show notes. Thanks for being here today. Thank Elka. you so much, Christine. Thanks for joining me today on this season two finale episode of the Hungarian Heritage Podcast. And thanks to my guest, Ilka Coxis, for sharing all about her four-week cultural experience in Budapest as a Balashi Summer University Scholarship Award winner, and for telling us all about the second edition of her cookbook memoir, Ilka's Kitchen. Don't forget to check the show notes for this episode to find out how you can connect with Ilka to purchase a copy of her book. You will also find information about the Balashi Summer Program and details about how you can apply for the scholarship for next year. Make sure you stay tuned to my social media for details about how you can enter to win a free copy of Ilka's Kitchen. If you have feedback or questions about today's episode or you would like to connect with me at the podcast, you will also find my email, social media information, and podcast website in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this episode and you're interested in learning more about this Hungarian heritage community that we are building, please don't hesitate to reach out. I would love to hear from you. Our theme music is Hungarian Dance by Pony Music, used with special license from Envato Market. Thanks again for listening, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcast so we can continue to connect our modern lives with our Hungarian heritage and grow this Hungarian heritage community. Until next time, goodbye everyone. Sziasztok mindenkinek!